Hey guys, this is Onya. It's been a long time since I have uploaded the videos of the of the, the Jubilee study that I have been doing with Jackson Snyder and his group, the Vero Yahad. But I have decided to put in that time and effort to bring all the previous teachings I did on Jubilees onto YouTube. I have five teachings that I have not yet uploaded to YouTube, including this one. So I want to finally get that up there. It's been long enough, and I think you guys who have been following the Jubilee study would really like to finally be able to watch the, the rest of the series. Also, we ended about halfway through the Book of Jubilees. So we're obviously going to be continuing the series as long as Jackson Snyder is okay with it. We're going to continue through his uh, Zoom site or his Zoom link once a week, probably on Wednesdays. We're going to be continuing that series and going all the way through Jubilees and dissecting it. So this video is about Abraham in the Book of Jubilees, and it covers from the birth of Abraham all the way up to the time that Abraham circumcises, uh, all the way to when circumcision is originated in the story of Abraham's life. So that's really where this video uh, series of Jubilees dives into. Of course, I always make connections and branch off on some tangents, but overall that's what the video here is about. I want to mention that it would be awesome if you guys wanted to support what I'm doing. Please, at the very least, pray for the success of what I'm trying to do. But if you would like to help in a more tangible, concrete way, uh, you can message me. I previously tried to have people sign up through Patreon. However, it does not seem like Patreon is the ideal way to go anymore. Even though lots of people get tons of money through Patreon, I have come to the conclusion that it is a scam or it's a waste of, of monetary donation. If you really truly want to donate to someone, don't do it through Patreon. I mean, it's nice about Patreon is it's automatic and you don't have to worry about it. But what's bad about it is your donation is cut. A portion of your donation is taken away and, and not given to the people you're donating to. So that is very annoying and makes makes it makes it preferable to send money to people on a different platform sending them directly through through uh, like Facebook you can send money through Facebook you can also send money through Google and I'd rather people send it every month if they're gonna send money I want them to actually choose to do it because if you sign up and say I'm gonna send money every month automatically through Patreon then you might not even think much of it and it's just gonna keep automatically coming which is great but I'd rather have someone who's truly invested in what I'm doing truly believes in what I'm doing and decides you know what I'm gonna make that decision every month I'm gonna take the effort to send that person the money because if they're willing to take that effort, then they truly believe in the cause. If they're just doing the automatic renewal and they're not even thinking about it, it uh, can be easy to forget about it and then you feel trapped financially or stuck in a situation that you don't want to be in. So I would just rather people be very much aware every time of when they're donating. But yeah, you guys, I... It could, it could really help me. The, the, the several ways it can help is um, it, it allows me to not have to work as much 
but I still need to find a job uh, because I gotta cover basic basic uh, finances, basic expenses. So I'm I'm working on getting a, a part time job, but um, eventually I'd like to not have to work a regular job and be fully funded by either donations or some of my investments. I am trying to invest some of the money that I make from my job, uh, from the jobs I've done in the past. I try to invest it into the stocks. There's a lot of things I want to do going forward that I could really use your guys' help. So, but anyways, you know, don't feel obligated to donate to me, but definitely try to donate to someone you believe in. And there's other ways you can get involved to help to help me. And I would very greatly appreciate any assistance where possible. Anyways, that's all I have to say for this introduction. And I hope you enjoy this series on the Book of Jubilees and this particular video. Unfortunately, the recognitions that, you know, Jackson's version is based heavily on the recognitions. The problem is recognitions was um, Catholicized or whatever you call it. Um, by Rufinus, the church father. That's why it had to be fixed. It's well, unfortunately, a church it story. needs to be fixed even farther because yeah. um, some of the original Greek is actually, or I don't know if it, the original was Greek, but obviously the Latin was translated from Greek. This and, was originally in Aramaic, so they think in this Aramaic uh, Clementines, it the Aramaic was version was made from the Latin version. So people think they're, we're getting the Aramaic version. Yeah, we're getting right to the earliest version. But from what I've read, uh, the Aramaic is just right off of the Latin. But you can correct that. When do we start? Um, but yeah, we'll have to talk about that another time. I see we're recording now, and we should get to Jubilees. Uh, but basically, Derek, uh, the... The, the the final thing you asked uh, it's it's actually not the Ethiopic um, basically there's a whole Clementine literature and so the Nazarene Acts is just the recognitions of Clement um, the what the writing I was alluding to is part of the Ethiopian Clement writings and there's a large uh, group of those writings as well a huge portion of of the Ethiopian Clement has not been translated into English yet. So that's that's one of the big reasons it's I haven't been doing some of the stuff with that book yet because it hasn't been translated into English. So it makes it hard to do that. Uh, to, but I have an idea of what that book contains. I've done a Google translation of it before and it gives me a good overview of it. But, uh, but the, the actual quote that I was reading from is from a portion that was actually translated professionally into English. Uh, so I'll have to post that in the group or something, the quote that I was talking about. Anyways, let's get into Jubilees. Um, let me pull up my outline. So we left off last time with the genealogy stuff. You know, that was a lot of stuff to go through, a little tedious in some ways. Uh, we, had, we did two whole videos on it. So, but we've pretty much finished all that, so that's good. Uh, there were some insights, cool insights that we went into uh, in those genealogy stuff, but it's, I'm glad, in some ways I'm glad we can move on to some of the more uh, uh, narrative substance of Jubilees. So, um, the Jubilees, as I said other, in the other teaching we did, for each patriarch, it kind of gives a little uh, description of that person was named such and such because of the time they were living in, things were like this. So the one, I think it was Serug, let me, let me look that up here. Uh, no, it was... Um, yeah, okay, so, so, uh, so Reu, 
Pele named his son Reu, and Reu meant evil, and that was because, uh, according to Jubilees, um, the Tower of Babel was being built in that time. Reu named his son Serug uh, because everyone had turned aside to all kinds of sin and transgression. So that implies that Reu was also righteous uh, because he was naming his son. Reu was grieved that the whole world was turning to sin. Serug, however, it says in Jubilees, Serug, he dwelt in Ur of the Chaldees, or, and it says he worshipped idols. So Serug was the first in Abraham's ancestry to start worshipping idols. Um, and Serug had a son named Nahor, and Nahor was um, uh, also mixed up with idolatry and uh, divination. And then Nahor had a son, Terah, and Terah was also mixed up with the idolatry. And of course, then Abraham was born, and Abraham was raised up in the world of idolatry. And we actually see this in the Apocalypse of Abraham. Now, this is a Slavonic writing, uh, which, well, it's preserved in Slavonic. However, there is some evidence that suggests that this Apocalypse of Abraham is derived from a previous source. And um, I mention it because I think it might be connected with uh, the Genesis Apocryphon, and Genesis Apocryphon is connected with Jubilees, as I, as I have suggested. So, this is one of those things that's, like, really frustrating, um, because you know how, you know how, um, the, like, the, uh, have you ever seen instances where, like, you're looking at for a verse in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and the exact word you're looking for, like, the Dead Sea School fragment stops right at the plot at the place you're trying to find. Have Always. you guys ever experienced that? All the time, all the time. <laughs> all the well, controversial verses. Yeah. Well, well, uh, I, I don't think there's a conspiracy for that. Some people believe there is, but I think it's just, uh, I think, you know, there is predestination, and I think some of that was, isn't coincidence that there's certain things that were not preserved and perhaps to test people, you know, like the, the, um, interesting, you know, with the whole Enoch thing, the whole parables section is missing. And some people believe the parables uh, is post Messiah because it's so, it speaks so highly of the son of man thing. Um, I think that, that, that son of man stuff in the book of Enoch is legit and part of the original book of Enoch. It just, unfortunately was not found in the Dead Sea Scrolls for some reason. Um, and so what's interesting about this whole Apocalypse of Abraham thing, the Genesis of Park Fun has the Book of Abraham, but only part, the first part of it. It breaks off in the middle of the book and the rest is missing. The place where it breaks off is the exact place where the Apocalypse of Abraham picks up. Um, with the vision given to Abraham. So it's just frustrating because if a little bit more had been preserved, we could have determined if the Apocalypse of Abraham is legit or not. Because if a little bit more was preserved, we might have seen the original Apocalypse of Abraham. And then we could have been like, okay, this Sylvanic text is is nonsense. It's not, it's not real. Or we could have said, wow, this Apocalypse of Abraham is very ancient. But at the exact place where we would have been able to find out, it broke off. So I can speculate, and my speculation is plausible, but we don't know for sure, but I, I believe that the, the Apocalypse of Abraham was originally part of the Genesis Apocryphon. Um, so anyways, in that, in that Apocalypse of Abraham, it also has a section about idolatry, and it gives a very in-depth view of the idolatry uh, in Abraham's time. And it tells us how Abraham separated himself from his father. And uh, according to Jubilees, it speaks also of the separation uh, that Abraham did. It says that 
when Abraham was only 14 years old, he separated himself from his father because his father worshipped idols and he didn't want to worship idols. So that's a pretty powerful thing because it tells us that it tells us that as a mere 14 year old, he was accountable for worshiping idols and he knew better. He knew enough at the, that young age to know that it was wrong to worship idols. And you think of 14, he said he left his father. Like um, if that would happen in our day, you know, if, you, if, you're, if your child was to, uh, to run away from home, people would call the child protective services and be like, oh, my, my child ran away. You know, um, but in the older time period of Jubilees, people who are 14 years old, they're practically adults. They're not quite adults yet, but they are more mature than mere kids, and they can live on their own, uh, as Abraham here did. So that's a, an interesting detail we get in Jubilees that we don't see in Genesis and shows how righteous Abraham was because Imagine this. Imagine if you or I was raised up in idolatry. And in a sense, we were. We were raised up in, in the Christianity. Uh, and not all Christianity is idolatrous, but a lot of it is. So um, we were raised up in idolatry in a sense, and we clung to idolatrous ideas because that's we didn't know any better. And we only started breaking away from that when we became adults. Imagine if you were born to an adult, idolatrous family, like an, a, a Hindu family that worships idols. Well, that's all you'll ever know. It's very likely that you're going to be worshiping idols because that's what you were raised up into. Abraham was raised into that, but he was so righteous that even though he was born into that type of, of life, at such a young age, he realized it was wrong and left. How many of us could, that, could we have done that at such a young age? So it, that's just one of the many ways that Abraham was such a righteous and faithful person. We begin to have an idea of how righteous and faithful he truly was when we see stuff like this. That, you know, when he was a child, he might have worshipped idols because he didn't know any better. He didn't even understand. As a child, you don't even understand what you're doing. Like, when we were in church, when we were five years old, we don't know what we were doing. We're just being told stuff, and we go along with it. We don't understand. So I don't think... You know, I don't think a five-year-old doing something with idols is considered an idolater because they don't even have the comprehension of what an idol even is. Um, they're just going through the motions. But at a certain age, you do have that ability to understand what an idol is. And we see in Jubilees that Abraham had that understanding when he was 14. So that's important because it tells us that teenagers do have an understanding and they are held accountable. Uh, so we should hold, hold them to a higher standard, um, not as a full adult, but we cer certainly we certainly should not teach teenagers treat teenagers as little kids. They are definitely responsible for their actions. You know, there's there's even been you know there's an interesting if you look into the age of criminals, uh, horrible horrible crimes. There have been murderers as young as seven years old. Uh, shockingly enough and um, so teenagers are definitely capable of horrible sin especially murder and uh, rape and all kinds of horrible stuff so we definitely see here Jubilees gives us testimony to this accountability that teenagers have I think that's important right? so next we have an interesting story in Jubilees that's not true to at all in Genesis, and that's the ravens. In fact, it tells us in Jubilees that Terah was named Terah because the ravens were uh, coming down and attacking, um, attacking uh, the uh, their seed. the The seed of the land was being destroyed by the ravens. It was being eaten, and there was a horrible famine as a result of this. Um, According to Jubilees, Abraham is the big hero of the day. He basically, he goes around and drives all the clouds of ravens away by yelling and, and shooing them away. It says he did that 70 times in a single day. And because he did that, his name became great in the land. So Abraham started to get very popular 
and well known in the region. You can see why Abraham eventually became really rich because he was so popular amongst the people. He was, um, a lot of people have a tendency to kind of shy away from the rest of the world. You know, you, you have a lot of people who are trying to leave society and, and say, let, let the rest of the world burn. We are going to be righteous and we're going to stay away from the wicked people. Abraham didn't do that, however. Abraham tried to help people even though they were idolaters. So these idolaters were dying because of famine, because of the raven issue. Abraham, however, in his righteousness, he didn't care that they were idolaters, sinners, wanted to help people. And innocent people dying every day uh, because of famine. So he uh, intervened and he helped save the day. And it, um, I know it's very basic, but it, it just, it shows us, you know, how determined he was and how determined we can be, like, to, uh, it says in a single day, he drove away clouds of ravens 70 times. That's a huge, exhausting amount of work, and, and a lot of us wouldn't go to those lengths to do it, but it tells us that if we go to those lengths, we can accomplish, like, we can, we can do a great work if we're willing to put in the time and effort and labor to do it. And when we do it, we will be rewarded and we will be blessed because other people will see how intense we were and how much effort we put in and helped people, and they will honor that. Um, and it tells us that Abraham actually invented some of the agricultural technology. It says that be, um, once he... Uh, protected the land from the ravens, he then invented certain uh, technology which would prevent the ravens from destroying all the seed in the future, in future harvests, in future uh, planting seasons. So this technology he then shared to people. So we see, we see evidence in scriptures of the technology being revealed to the patriarchs and then spread to the nations. So, um, we know Enoch learned a lot of technology, and he learned about the calendar, and he spread that to the different nations. Uh, according to Genesis Apocryphon, Abraham taught the Egyptians from the book of Enoch and told them um, about the calendar stuff. And the, the Egyptians uniquely had a solar calendar uh, in the ancient times. So um, according to the scriptures, all their... Uh, some of their uh, intelligence and technology and understanding of the Egyptians actually came from the patriarchs. So that's uh, another interesting thing that we see. Also, from a language perspective, Jubilees tells us that the original language was Hebrew. However, the problem with that is that Hebrew clearly was not the original language, at least the Hebrew preserved in the Bible, because uh, that's a very late uh, language, and it has uh, is part of the Semitic family of languages. Um, there's many features which show that Hebrew does not preserve certain parts of the language that was original that other languages do preserve, like Aramaic, for example, preserves certain elements of Semitic language that he did not preserve. Uh, so, on the one hand, Jubilee says that Hebrew is the original. On the other hand, we, we have too much evidence from a linguistic perspective that Hebrew could not have possibly been the original. So how do we reconcile that? I believe that when it says Hebrew, it has a different thing in mind. Just like I've touched on this before, English, according to us, English, we know what English is, that's modern English. Um, let me, I'm not going to read it to you guys, but let me just post in the link here in the, in the text box, the Lord's Prayer in the oldest English that exists. I, I've, I've touched upon this before, but I love, I love this topic because it shows us the, the evolution of language. Okay, so here is the... Uh, Lord's Prayer in English. Uh, whoops. 
I wanted to, it didn't let me uh, copy and paste the text. It just, okay. It's one of those things that you, where you copy and paste the text, it also copies the link. So anyway, box, the group chat, you see Old English Prayer, that was English. That looks nothing like modern English. You apply this principle to every language because every language has this evolution. And you can only conclude that the same thing happened with Hebrew, and that the Hebrew of the Bible could not have been the original Hebrew. So we can set up Jubilees and say, yes, Hebrew is the original language. We can believe that, but we cannot believe biblical Hebrew is the original Hebrew. There's no way possible. The original Hebrew had to have been something like what we see here analogous to Old English compared to Modern English. So imagine this major change in the Old English that we see compared to Modern English, that radical change is a similar level of change between the original Hebrew and the Biblical Hebrew. That's how radically different the Hebrew language changed. Um, now, we also have to think, it tells us that, Jubilees tells us that uh, when, when the Tower of Babel happened, everyone lost Hebrew. There are some rabbinic ideas that Hebrew was not lost from a few people, like a, a strain, uh, but that's not valid according to scripture. The original language was lost completely. And um, at the same time, Jubilees tells us that even after the language was lost, people were still being named Semitic language, uh, Semitic words. Like um, uh, Serug is a Semitic word. Nahor, Semitic. Tera, Semitic. These are Semitic words, so it suggests that perhaps, you know, it says that the um, Tower of Babel created all kinds of different languages. Uh, incident, it created all those different languages. Maybe one of the languages created was the original Aramaic or something like that, um, which would have Semitic features, but it would be a alteration of the original Hebrew. So we do, we do see the uh, interesting connections of linguistic stuff uh, here. Jackson, did you want to say something or, or no? I can't hear you. You're muted. No, I'm just making faces at myself. I couldn't tell because you like you were leaning in. It almost looked like you wanted to say something. But well, okay. it's because I'm trying to look at something on here and <laughs> it just... I'm, I'm on another uh, Jubilees page. So oh, okay. don't pay any attention to that. All right. Don't pay any attention to the man behind the curtain. Okay. Well, right. <laughs> um, so anyways, there's some interesting insights you can get from if you believe Jubilees is legit, how does it relate to linguistic stuff? Um, and so that's what we can see. You know, in the book of Genesis, we're told that Adam was named Adam and Eve was named Eve for the reasons um, and it's connected to a Hebrew explanation. Uh, so that suggests that, at least according to the scriptures, there was a Semitic, a language, the original language of Adam was a Semitic language of some kind. And um, it doesn't agree with mainstream scholarship of, of language, but um, there are interesting things showing how amazingly universal the Semitic language is. One of the things is, it's kind of amazing that every language, except for the African languages and American languages, uh, basically every developed language for the most part, and uh, I guess like some of the Chinese languages, uh, pretty much all the languages are now using the Hebrew alphabet. So it's kind of cool that the Hebrew alphabet was um, transferred to the Greeks and Latins uh, through the Greek alphabet. As we know, I'm not sure if everyone here knows, but historically, the Greek alphabet was actually just copied from the Hebrew alphabet and a few extra letters were added. Um, and then from Greek, different alphabets came from that. The Armenian alphabet, the Coptic alphabet. And so, all these different alphabets of the main languages are derived from Hebrew. 
So if we see the world we live in, all these languages, so many of these languages are derived from Hebrew alphabet, then perhaps it is also plausible that all the languages may have also been derived from uh, um, let me see. Uh, I was going to say this, but I'm not sure actually. The, the Tower of Babel incident um, doesn't say that all languages are derived from Hebrew. It just says all, con all kinds of languages pop out of nowhere. Um, but my point was that if Hebrew is like the central universal language of the alphabet, it could perhaps be the original language as well of, uh, of all languages. And then the Tower of Babel created all the different languages. Uh, Mainstream scholarship does not agree with the Tower of Babel incident. They don't believe that actually happened. But if we believe what the Bible says, then apparently something like that did happen. And you do have to wonder if from a, from a uh, scientific perspective, um, if, if everyone originally had one language, which makes sense, if, if, if all people, you know, if all people come from two people, which it has to be the case, so from a scientific biological basis, everyone had to come from two people. Well, if everyone was speaking the same language, how did all these languages pop out of nowhere? Um, it makes sense if there was an event like this where a radical confusion of languages happened uh, in a single moment. That explains the diversity really well. The radical diversity we see is not well explained from a natural perspective, I don't, I don't think. Um, we're, if, we, if we take the account in Genesis, we know that there were 70 nations, so there were 70 languages, it appears. And uh, from those 70 languages, all languages today come into to existence. Now, I have touched upon um, this in other teachings, but I want to emphasize this, that it really seems like Jubilees is hinting at another book of Jubilees that once existed, and that is uh, with where the passage where it speaks of um, Abraham is revealed, he is taught the original language of Hebrew, it says, and then he is given the books the books of his his fathers, and uh, he trans he transcribes them, and the angel he studies those six books he studies those books and for six months he studies them and the angel of jubilees actually explains to Abraham how to understand the scriptures, and that very same thing is happening with jubilees where it has. It has um, Moses be giving, being given a lesson, an overview of all the different scriptures, Genesis of the Testaments of the Patriarchs. Uh, he's being taught about all the scriptures, Moses, by the angel. For 40 days, he's being taught that. In the same way, it's suggesting that for six months, Abraham was also being taught by the angels. And we found a fragment in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which appears to be from an earlier book of Jubilees. I argue that it's not an earlier book of Jubilees, it's a, it's a completely different book of Jubilees that was, that was given to Abraham. Um, now, we see in Genesis about Haran and the thing with Heron is Genesis gives us like no real information. It gives us like a very tantalizing detail, which doesn't make sense. Like, why would Genesis tell us this? Unless the author of Genesis believed that there was more information that you could get elsewhere. It says in verse 28, of chapter 11 of Genesis, and Haran died before his father Terah in his native land, in Ur of the Chaldees. So wait, Haran died before his father? That's an interesting story. Why? 
we don't know why, according to Genesis, but we do know why, according to Jubilees. Jubilees tells us that Abraham wanted his father to, to stop uh, worshiping idols. He told his family, his brothers and his dad, stop worshiping idols. And his dad said he wanted to stop, but he was afraid to do so. So Terah was afraid that the people of the land would kill him if he stopped worshiping idols. And according to the Apocalypse of Abraham, Terah made idols and sold idols to people. So if that's true account, that Terah was responsible for making idols and giving them to people, then you could understand why Tara was concerned that if he stopped worshiping idols, that people would want to kill him. Well, Abraham saw that his father was so afraid to stop, but he knew his father wanted to stop. So Abraham saved his own father's life, and secretly, Abraham burned the house of idols, it says. And it says that no one else knew that Abraham had done this, but he did it secretly. And when after Abraham burned it, Haran saw the house of idols burning, and Haran loved the idols so much, he wanted to save the idols, and he tried to save them, but he ended up dying in the fire. So, of course, if Jubilees is correct, that is why Haran died before his father. And you can understand why the author of Genesis would omit that, because that's a very shameful thing. Uh, why, it would exp why it would omit telling us that Haran died because of idolatry. Uh, it was a shame. So instead of giving that detail, the author of Genesis just passes over it and says, Haran died before his father. But in honor of, of the memory, doesn't mention why that it was idolatry. Because that's, that's a stain on the family of Abraham. It's a, it's a negative quality of Abraham's family that Haran was so uh, obsessed with idols that he died to save idols. Um, Another uh, speculation I've mentioned before is that um, why is it called Hebrew? And I believe that may be because Eber was still alive when Abraham was alive and that Eber gave the... Eber couldn't read the scriptures anymore because the Hebrew language had been lost. He couldn't read the scriptures, but he preserved the scriptures because he knew they were important, the writings of the, of the forefathers. And Abra gave the writings to Abraham because Abraham forsook idolatry. And Abra knew that, and, and he only trusted Abraham to preserve the scriptures. Because it says in Jubilee that Abraham had the scriptures of his forefathers, but it doesn't tell us how he got those scriptures. Well, Terah was an idolater. Nahor was an idolater. Sarah was an idolater. So why would any of them have preserved the scriptures? In seem like for someone like Eber to preserve the scriptures and hand them over to Abraham. And if that was the case, it would make sense why it was why it would be called Hebrew in honor of Eber's testimony and preservation of the scriptures. Again, that's just speculation on my part, but it's very plausible, I think. Um, so what's Interesting is that we see, according to Jubilees, Abraham did not leave his father in the way that we think he did from Genesis. Genesis makes it seem like Abraham was a bad son and basically forsook his father and didn't care about his father and just left. He left his land of, of, of origin to the promised land and he forsook everything. He forsook his father. He just left. Um, but it says he, he took Lot with him. Let me see where it says that in Genesis. Uh, um, it says, Abraham departed and took Lot with him. He departed from his father, Terah, and took Lot with him. But he doesn't tell us why. Why did Abraham take Lot? Lot wasn't even his son. Lot was Haran's son. That's weird. Why did he do that? Jubilees tells us why. Tells us, basically, that Abraham was going to go to the promised land, and then once he found a place, he was then going to send back for his father 
and bring his father there. So it's not the case that Abraham planned to abandon his father. Rather, it would, it would not have been a good idea for them all to, to leave and find nothing. If they went nowhere and had no place to live, well, that would doom them all. So Terah wanted to join them, but Terah basically was being cautious and said, you go first, you find a place, and when you find the place, send back for me and we will come too. The, the place where he says that is, um, let's see here. Um, this is in chapter 12, and it says, Oh, okay, so verse 28 says, Abraham spoke to his father and informed him that he would leave Haran to go into the land of Canaan to see it and return to him. And Terah, his father, said unto him, Go in peace. Uh, may the eternal God make thy path straight, and may he protect you from all evil, and blah, blah, blah. And then he says, If thou seest the land pleasant to thy eyes to dwell in, then arise and take me to thee, and take Lot with thee, the son of Haran thy brother as thine own son. The Lord be with thee. And Nahar thy brother, lead with me till thou returnest in peace. And we go with them all together. So basically what that tells us is um, Terah wanted to go, but he was a little bit concerned that it was going to be safe. And he was like, go see if you find good land. If you find good land, come back and bring us back with you. However, take Lot, because Lot doesn't have a father anymore. And, and, and because Abraham was so righteous, who, who would be a better father than Abraham? So um, he appointed Haran to be, uh, excuse me, he appointed Lot to be uh, Abraham's adopted son. So it, that, that explains why Genesis just random, Genesis randomly tells us Abraham left with Lot, but it doesn't tell us why. And there's a lot of things like that in Genesis where Genesis gives us little snippets, but it doesn't tell us why. And, there's so many things it's like, that doesn't make sense. Why did that happen? Like another example, this is a really funny thing, but in Genesis, we just see Jacob's walking through, through the wilderness. He's just walking, and then all of a sudden, a random dude comes and starts wrestling him, uh, wrestling him out of nowhere. And then he says, tell me your name. Tell me your name. And then... Um, and that's like a weird story. It's so peculiar, and it's just randomly in Genesis, and we don't know why. Like, why did he start wrestling with him? Out of nowhere, you just, like, who does that? Who just walks up to someone and just starts wrestling with them, and they're a complete stranger? That's a very weird story. You would think that we would get more clarity, but Genesis doesn't give us clarity. But in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have a fragment which gives us more clarity. Unfortunately, it's fragmentary, so we don't know the full story, but basically... Basically, um, Abraham was told ahead of, uh, I keep saying, mixing up, I'm sorry. Jacob was told ahead of time. Jacob was told ahead of time by the creator or by an angel that he was going to meet someone and he was going to wrestle the person. So there was an introduction. <clears throat> Abraham was warned about it in advance. He was told what it was going to be about. So Abraham was prepared. Uh, Jacob was prepared. Jacob was prepared in advance. Um, uh, because he was instructed about it. So this is just an example of how the Dead Sea Scrolls, these extra books, give us fuller information that Genesis doesn't tell us, and the way Genesis tells us, it's just so weird and, and implies that there has to be more to the story, and there must be other writings which go fuller into that story. So this detail of Lot, is best explained by a previous account like Genesis Parkfon or Jubilees. Um, now let's see here. I've also touched upon how Genesis Parkfon and Jubilees has so many links, and some of the links here are a specific mention of of Abraham observing the land. I don't think we see that in Genesis, but we do see that in Jubilees and it's touched upon in great detail in Genesis Apocrypha. Also, the number of years Abraham stays in each place. Like, 
Jubilees gives extra detail for the chronology, like how many years he was here, how many years he was here, what year he was when he went to a certain place. Genesis Apocryphon has the same exact information and it perfectly matches what Jubilee says. Again, evidence supporting that uh, idea, uh, idea of the link between Genesis Apocryphon and Jubilees. And one of the most interesting um, chronological information that we see, we're told in Genesis that Abraham's wife, Sarai, was taken by Pharaoh. We're not told how long this was, though. According to the book of Jasher and rabbinic doctrine, it was for a single night, a single day, and that was it. And then after the one day, Sarah was returned uh, back to uh, Abraham. Well, according to Genesis Apocryphon and Jubilees, Sarah was in captivity by Pharaoh for two full years. So imagine two. And Pharaoh wanted to sleep with Sarah for two years, and he had the ability as a Pharaoh, he could have basically ordered it. But through, the, through a divine intervention, somehow Sarah was preserved pure, and she did not end up being violated by the Pharaoh. So that's, an, that's a miracle for two years. One night is not much of a miracle, as Jasher and rabbinic tradition says. But that's a major contradiction. I've heard of people who believe that both Jubilees and Jasher are scripture. Have you ever heard of people like that? I used to be one of those people way back long ago, like in 2010. But then I realized there's way too many contradictions between Jubilees and Jasher. So if you're going to go with... Uh, them being scripture, you have to go with one or the other. You can't go with both. There's just no way of reconciling them. Um, but there are people who claim that both are scripture. And that tells me, what that tells me is they have not looked at both in depth. Because there's no way looking at them in depth you can conclude that both are valid. Because the two books couldn't be more contradictory if someone tried. Like they are literally contradictory on every page and almost every detail. But one of the big contradictions is how long they were, Sarah was with, with Pharaoh. Plenty more major contradictions, but that was one of the big ones. Um, so then we see uh, Melchizedek. Who was Melchizedek? Well, there is a section in Jubilees where Melchizedek is completely missing for some reason. The reason for that appears to be scribal error, and but from the looks of it, what we can tell is that in Jubilees, Melchizedek was not that special of a person. Jubilees basically makes Melchizedek to be like a normal person. Um, he was obviously a priest and a king, but that he was not, like he was, you know how some people, some uh, Christians say that he was he was Jesus. Melchizedek was actually Messiah, uh, pre-incarnate. Uh, that's one of the false views. There's no hint of that in Genesis or in Jubilees. He's not an angelic being. He's just a regular man in Jubilees. But it's important because there's a lot of false doctrine about Melchizedek. And if Melchizedek had been a special figure, we would have seen, like a special angelic uh, divine figure, we would have seen evidence of that in these extra books. Genesis Apocryphon does preserve the account of Melchizedek, and it's a very basic account, just of, again, of a regular man. So these are important testimonies to, sh to refute the false doctrines uh, that surround Melchizedek. If Melchizedek had been a special man, we would have seen, Jubilees would have told us. Genesis Apocryphon would have told us. It doesn't, so we know that he was just a regular man. And when he does, it tell, Jubilees connects the tithe, the origin of the tithe, with, with, um, with Abraham. But the extra detail that it gives is, is linked with the temple scroll. 
it says, To this law there is no limit of days, for he hath ordained it for the generations forever, that they should give to the Lord the tenth of everything, of the seed, and of the wine, and of the oil, and of the cattle, and of the sheep. So let's see what there. The seed, or the grain, the wine, and the oil. The temple school has the festival of the first fruits of wheat, festival of the first fruits of wine, and the festival of the first fruits of oil. And those are in the original Torah that the temple school preserves. Jubilees testifies to that fact. The book of Nehemiah testifies to that fact that these three festivals were part of the Torah originally. And there's just so many writings in the prophets where all three wheat, wine, and oil are linked together as a special uh, first fruits. And it makes sense that that would be the case if the Temple Scroll or the Fuller Torah had those laws. So Julius is an important piece of evidence supporting that. Later down in one of our uh, later teachings of Jubilees, I'm going to show another passage which strikingly confirms the Temple Scroll, corroborates the account of the Temple Scroll. So we, um, we'll, go, we'll talk about that at another time, though, but there's just a lot of evidence connecting Jubilees with all kinds of things. Genesis Apocrypha, Testament of Abraham, Amram, um, the Testaments of the Patriarchs, uh, it connects it with the Enoch literature. Jubilees kind of Septuagint, Samaritan, the Dead Sea Schools, uh, Temple School. There's just unbelievable connections that, that Jubilees has, which can't be coincidence. It shows that Jubilees must be an ancient writing because it's so intertwined with all these different sources. Um, so that, that's one of the important pieces of information that we can get from Jubilees. Now, um, the Girgashites, well, that's an interesting thing, the Girgashites, I want to touch upon this. Um, in, when the covenant is revealed to a Abram, uh, he's told by the Creator, to Abraham's seed will be given the land um, from the different nations, and it lists seven nations, and one of the Girgashites. Well, what's strange is that in the Masoretic text, in many places, the Girgashites are missing. In the Septuagint and Samaritan, the Girgashites are there, and in the Dead Sea Scroll, the Girgashites are there, including the Temple Scroll. So we see that all the original evidence points us to the Girgashites being always in that list. And for some reason, the Masoretic scribes had a polemic to remove the Girgashites from the list. And they do that a lot in the Masoretic text, a lot. Uh, so Jubilees is just one more support of the whole Girgashite thing being included in the list. Can I break in just a minute? Sure. Girgashites. <clears throat> Are you a, Ger a Gergershite? No, I don't think so. I, I recall, maybe I mixed up here, but I ca recall in the New Testament, there's an altern alternative reading. I might be wrong here. Gergasa, an alternate reading being Gadara. Let's see. Um, I think it's regarding these um, legions, these uh, demon-possessed men. Oh, okay, let's see. Um, would, would that be one of the reasons that there's an alternative reading there? Um, it could be related, but I don't think like because it, it's the New Testament, so I don't think I don't think the Masoretic scribes, you know, like no, were reading no, the New Testament. Um, but I'm thinking maybe. And this is kind of a long shot, but maybe um, the, the, the writer of the Gospels there were influenced. Certainly they were influenced by, by Jubilees, and 
I always just wondered about that alternative reading. How could they get so mixed up on this? Gurgasa and Gadara, but that's all right. That's in, yeah. The, the, the situation with the New Testament is very complex in the textual yeah. thing, the textual situation. Um, I do want to say this is a little bit unrelated, but um, I know this is kind of contrary to what people have been telling, saying, but uh, through my studies, I have concluded that the, of the five, uh, of the four Gospels, Matthew through John, I find the Matthew least reliable. Um, there's reasons I think that there's a lot of evidence that appears that Matthew, the gospel of Matthew was kind of, um, softening harsher statements. Um, and there's just a lot of things where you compare the different gospels and the, uh, there's contradictions. But it's about time you came to that conclusion, because you were hard on, uh, uh, Matthew being the first gospel for a I long was? time. Oh, yes, you were. Back <laughs> years ago, we got into a little talk about, you know, what who had the priority, Mark or Matthew? Who oh, well, Matthew, man. yeah, I think at one time I thought Matthew was original, like the first. Uh, I, I, I do Matthew. think that the Gospel of Matthew in its original form is not what we have today. I think. Yeah, I, I think some of the sources of Matthew, like especially five to seven could be not unlike what was it Papias that said that um, Matthew wrote down a Hebrew version of the sayings of Yahshua. I think five through seven in Matthew is much earlier than the rest of the text. And obviously it comes from a different source. I have a slightly different view on that for you. Um, I think if you compare, what's interesting, if you compare the Sermon on the Mount to the Sermon on the Plain in Luke, you line it up. There's a lot of lining up, but one of the things that it, what's interesting is that the blessings and curses, um, there's blessings and curses in Luke, but there's only blessings in, in Matthew. And in Luke, the blessings are, are all negative, whereas in Matthew the blessings are like, eh, like uh, I know this is a tangent from Jubilees, but I, I want to just touch upon this for a sec. Um, so, uh, for example, blessed are those who hunger, for you should be filled. That's Luke's. Then it, the curse is, woe to you who are uh, full now, for you shall hunger. Well. Matthew removes the curse and changes it. Instead of blessed are you who hunger, it says it, hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are you who hunger for righteousness. So Luke has the true original meaning, blessed are you those who hunger, implying that you should be fasting. You know, righteousness requires you to be hungry sometimes, to, to, to um, humble yourself and not be full of food constantly. Uh, but to be blessed are those who hunger uh, for the sake of righteousness. For the sake of righteousness could mean uh, not hungering for righteousness, but hungering out of righteousness. That would be a more valid way of looking at it. But the idea that it means hungering after righteousness because you want to be righteous, that's not what the Messiah meant at all. Another one is, uh, blessed are those who are poor. We know, you know, the whole Ebionite thing, the poor. Uh, the, the poor were, were praised, but the rich were condemned in Scripture, typically. Uh, James speaks harshly against the rich. and um, But so in Luke, you have, blessed are the poor. Matthew, you have, blessed are the poor in spirit. And what does that even mean, in spirit? It appears that the scribe, copying Matthew was uncomfortable with the idea that the poor will be blessed. So they added in spirit to try to change the meaning or something. Um, so I, I think that the, um, I think the original sermon did not have all those blessings, uh, like blessed are the peacemakers. I don't think that was originally part of the sermon. I don't think it was made up either. I just think 
if the original blessings were scattered throughout the narrative, and one of the scribes, just like how I've talked about the Long temple school, mm -hmm. rearranging things, putting it in different order, I think that's what happened with Matthew. Matthew's gospel was originally dispersed in different, the sayings were dispersed, and the scribes redacted to make a new sermon with all those sayings together. Well, that word blessed, makarioi, doesn't mean blessed anyway. I mean, they, they finally came up with a, a source that gave them an idea of what it meant. More like congratulations or good for you than blessing. So, uh, Makarioi. Well, that's the Greek. I, I'm off subject, sorry. No, that's all right. That's all right. Um, let's see. I think, let me see where we end today um i think we'll end with um i think i want to end with the circumcision stuff um because we've been going for about an hour i know we're trying to keep these to about an hour uh so let me just say that um, at, this, at this time when, um, you know, in the account of Genesis where Abraham is like, who's going to be my heir? And then that's when he has the vision and he's told about the future uh, and that he's going to have an heir from his own seed. Um, at that time, we're told that the previous times it was like an angel appearing to him or, or, the creator talking to him in his sleep or something. But in this occasion, apparently it was Yah, it was Yahuwah himself appearing to Abraham as El Shaddai. And, um, wait, no, wait. Actually, I think that's, that's the next part. Hold on. I'm sorry about that. Um, but at that time that I just mentioned when, when, uh, he had that vision, vision of the, of the future um, when he was wondering who his heir would be. According to Jubilees, at that time, a covenant was made and the, the covenant of Noah was renewed and the festival of Shavuot. So Abraham started keeping the festival of Shavuot at that time. Uh, and also, Genesis doesn't tell us this, but it says that the angels made a covenant, a separate covenant with Noah and Abraham. So that's kind of interesting detail like so Yahuwah made a covenant with Abraham and the angels separately made a covenant almost like that the angels would be him and would like support him or something it doesn't it doesn't really give too much information about what that covenant was but it gives us a little snippet that the angels actually made a covenant with Abraham and with Noah so then slightly later Yahuwah himself appears to Abraham as El Shaddai, makes a covenant with him, a, a, a different covenant with different, like each each time Yahuwah makes a covenant with Abraham, he gives him additional like separate blessings than the previous one. Uh, this one, he changes his name to Abraham from Abram and institutes the covenant of circumcision. Now, What's interesting about this is, you know, some people pronounce Abraham's name as Abraham. I think that's not how you pronounce his name. I think, I think in the original pronunciation, you had, okay, so his original name was Abram, right? Well, I, I pronounce it as, I pronounce the original as Abram. And then his name was changed, I believe, to Abram. So you have Abram and Abram. The one letter difference changes the sound slightly. Abram from Abram. Uh, that makes more sense. Like if if because it's clear that the name Abraham's new name was trying to be playing off the old name he had. It was changing his old name slightly to um, to give it a new meaning. Um, almost like a play on words and. But think about it, Abram and Abraham, they sound completely different. But Abram 
and Abram, they sound nearly identical. So that's more, to me, that makes more sense. Likewise, you have Sarai and Sarah. It's, it's sounds very similar. I, I pronounced it uh, originally as, I pronounced it, I believe, originally as Suri and Surah. Um, now we're told that the, we're told that why Abraham's name was changed and what Abraham's name means. We're told what Isaac's name means. We're told it means laugh, laughter, right? Ishmael, we're told because of, because Yahuwah heard me. Means, interestingly enough. Well, I believe that, like it says right here in Jubilees, it says, I will bless her and give thee a son by her, and I will bless him and he shall become a nation, and kings of nations shall proceed from him. Well, I think the original was instead of kings of nations, princes of nations shall proceed from him. You could see princes and kings could easily be interchanged. And princes make sense because the word for prince in Hebrew is sar or sir, you know, uh, prince of peace, sar. Um, and and um, and Sarah's name is also linked to that same root word, sar, sara. And in, in the Bible and the scriptures, that word Sarah is used elsewhere to mean princess or queen, basically a female noble person. And so it's basically calling her, uh, you'll be named, you are princess. Basically, prince means like a chief leader. A princess is a chief leader who happens to be female. So that would make sense because then, then the explanation of her name would be preserved. Instead of kings of nations, it would be princes of nations. You will be named Sarah because you will have a son, and through him there will be princes of nations. So you will be called princess because princes of nations shall come from you. That preserves the explanation of the name. Uh, I, I think that's a very plausible textual criticism that could explain the strange absence of the explanation of why Sarah's name was changed. Um, and so what's another peculiar thing is the eighth day of circumcision is focused upon in Jubilees in an extreme way that we don't see in the Masoretic text. However, the Septuagint and Samaritan have this same extreme focus on the eighth day. The way that Jubilees, Samaritan, and Septuagint present this covenant, um, if you were not circumcised on the eighth day, you were not part of the covenant in the same way. Uh, basically, you have to be circumcised on the eighth day or else you are excluded from the full, uh, from the full terms of the covenant. You, you can convert and be circumcised, but you will still be considered, like, like it says in the Temple Scroll and in the Torah, um, only after three generations can an Egyptian uh, join the assembly. What that means is, if you're an Egyptian and you want to convert to, to, the, to Israel, you can be circumcised, but you, and you can participate in some of the, the things you can, you, according to the temple school, there's three courtyards. So if, a, if an Egyptian, uh, the, um, basically um, the, the people in the third courtyard are those who are not full Israelites yet. And it says in the temple school that it's in the first three generations and women and children are in that third courtyard of Israel. The second courtyard is only for male Israelites who are adults. And so what that basically means is if you're an Egyptian and you want to convert to become an Israelite, you can become circumcised, but you can only be in the third courtyard, not the second courtyard. Your son also can only be in the third courtyard, uh, not in the second courtyard. And you have to be circumcised. Um, then your grandson also can only be in the third courtyard. Your great grandson he now, because it's now the fourth generation, he can now enter the second 
courtyard and be considered an Israelite. So what we see in Jubilees, Septuagint, and Samaritan, the eighth day is that in order for you to be considered a natural Israelite with all the rights of an Israelite, you have to be circumcised on the eighth day. The, the Jews actually had a false teaching in their tradition, the rabbinic tradition, where on certain occasions you can, you can skip the eighth day and do it on the ninth day or the seventh day. Like they, they have it so that you can, if it coincides with certain holidays, you can postpone it, they, they taught, uh, when the actual circumcision is done. And they believe, and, um, they believe the eighth day is not necessarily as important. If you're circumcised, that's all that matters to them. But we see from these scriptures that it is important. It, Jubilee tells us if you're not circumcised on the eighth day, so if you're circumcised before the eighth day or after, you are barred. Uh, let me read the passage. <clears throat> it says, um, and the uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin on the eighth day, that soul shall be cut off from the people. For he has broken my covenant. And then it says, <clears throat> This law is for all generations forever, and there is no circumcision of the days, and no omission of one day out of the eight days. For it is an eternal ordinance ordained and written on the heavenly tablets. And everyone that is born, the flesh whose foreskin is not circumcised on the eighth day, belongs not to the children of the covenant which the Lord made with Abraham, but to the children of, the, of destruction. So what it's telling us is that if you're circumcised on the seventh day, you do not belong to the covenant of the, of the children. You, know, you do not belong to the children of the covenant. If you're circumcised on the seventh day, sixth, fifth, fourth, third, second, first, ninth, or onward, you have to be circumcised on the eighth in order to be, belong to the children of the covenant. And we see that Abraham was circumcised and, um, and his whole household was circumcised. But Jubilee tells us that Isaac was the first one circumcised according to the covenant. It's how, let, let's see that verse. It says, the verse in question is that, that tells us that is, um, let's see, um, Hold on, let me just find it for a second. Okay, chapter 16, verse 14. It says, Abraham circumcised his son on the eighth day. That's Isaac. And it says, he was the first that was circumcised according to the covenant, which is ordained forever. So according to Jubilees, not even Abraham was circumcised according to the covenant. The terms of the covenant is circumcised on the eighth day. And who was the first? Isaac was the first. Abraham was circumcised, but not on the eighth day. So um, the, also this information about circumcision makes sense of the whole scenario with, with uh it's, it says in, in Exodus, it says that Yahuwah came to kill Moses, and then Moses' wife circumcises their son, throws the foreskin at Moses' feet, and says, the blood uh, of the foreskin has been shed, or, or something like that. Um, and it's just so weird. Why would, right after, right after, Yahuwah says, go Moses, I have chosen you right after he's trying to kill his own servant. It doesn't make sense. Jubilee says us the, the reason it was not Yahuwah who was trying to kill him. It was Satan, Mestima. And according to the Septuagint, we're told that it was not Elohim, but it was an angel of Elohim. So the, so the I think it's the Masoretic and the Samaritan, they say Elohim, uh, 
or maybe no, maybe it's Yahuwah. Uh, Yahuwah or Elohim, either one. But it says, basically, he tried to kill uh, Moses. Whereas Septuagint says, an angel of Yahuwah or an angel of Elohim tried to kill uh, Moses. And that makes sense in light of Jubilees. So the Septuagint actually agrees with Jubilees that it was an angel and not actually Yahuwah. And we know, as I've talked before, that Satan was chosen to be a servant for Yahuwah, an angel. Um, so so uh, Jubilees tells us that if you're not circumcised, if they, let me read that, it says, again, I read this before, but it says, Everyone that is born in the flesh of whose foreskin is not circumcised on the eighth day belongs not to the children of the covenant, but to the children of destruction. Nor is there, moreover, any sign in him that he is the Lord's, but he is to be destroyed and slain from the earth, and to be rooted out of the earth, for he has broken the covenant of the Lord our God. So what that means, from what I can tell, the original story behind Moses almost dying is that Moses was chosen as a leader. Satan opposed that and, and wanted Moses dead, but he didn't have authority over Moses if he um, was in line with the covenant. But the covenant was you had to circumcise your son. If you didn't circumcise your son on the proper day, you were excluded from the covenant. So Satan, um, so for some reason, Moses' wife did not want to circumcise their son. You know, that's a very hard thing to do, to circumcise your own son, because your son would be in pain. Um, so you can understand a woman, a woman would be sympathetic, more likely to be sympathetic with her child. This is her child that she just birthed out. She doesn't want her child to be cut up. So it appears to be that Moses' wife was withholding their son, and if the son was almost about to not be circumcised, so it, it was getting dangerously close to the covenant not being fulfilled. If Moses' son had not been circumcised, then Moses would have broken the covenant. And if Moses had broken that covenant, then Satan would have had a claim over Moses. And then Satan could have killed Moses because Moses would have been, as Jubilee says, if you don't, if you don't do the circumcision covenant, you're handed over to Satan, children of destruction, and you are to be destroyed and slain and rooted out of the earth. So because Moses was such an important figure, Satan had authority to kill him if his son was not circumcised. And that's why he was, Satan was like coming over to him and was like getting ready to kill him. He's like, okay, it's almost time. I almost have authority over you because you haven't circumcised your son. And then Moses' wife was like, okay, I don't want, I don't want uh, Moses to die. So she sucked it up and circumcised her son even though she didn't want to. And by doing that, she saved Moses' life because now they weren't handed over to Satan. They were under the protection of the covenant. Now, that's my explanation. It makes sense with what the Jubilees and Septuagint says specifically about circumcision. So, let's see, I think that's about it for today. Um, oh, the other thing, circumcision is forever, according to Jubilees, for all generations. So, we don't agree that the circumcision was done away with, um, but it's only for Israel, I believe. So, uh, but it's still for Israel. It's not no longer for Israel. It's always for Israel forever. That's what Jubilees tells us. And um, it's a sign of the covenant. And then it tells us that Israel is to be circumcised because angels are uh, also uncircumcised. Uh, excuse me. They are to be circumcised because angels are also circumcised. And that's like gives us a pause for a second. Wait a minute. Jubilees is saying that angels are circumcised? That's weird. Um, angels don't have gen genitals, so what? But I believe that it, we're just misunderstanding, basically, I think. I don't think it's saying that they had genital, angels have genitals, and that their foreskin was removed. I think it just means angels don't have foreskins, because they don't have genitals, but they don't have foreskins. And so, 
Israelites, they are supposed to be a holy people. Angels are holy. They're like the, the sons of God. So in order for Israelites to be like the angels, they, they are purifying themselves, making them holy, trying to be like more like the angels. You know, it says the angels kept all the different ho holy days. Angels kept the Sabbath. Angels kept Shavuot and the different festivals. In the same way, we see that Israel just like our, is to keep the Sabbath like the angels, is to keep Shavuot like the angels. And they are also to have no foreskin like the angels. No foreskin because probably I would imagine that the foreskin is a symbol of uncleanness, um, the, of the man's uncleanness. And um, we do know, for example, that the, the foreskin has um, increased pleasure and sensitivity. Um, and when you remove the foreskin, you're actually removing a man's ability to, to have sexual pleasure. He still, he still has ability to have sexual pleasure, but it's diminished. It's actually a diminished ability. And some people who are opponents of circumcision have strongly shown, like, have strongly focused on that point. They say circumcision is wrong because it deprives a man of his, abil his full ability for sexual uh, satisfaction. And it is true. The evidence, scientific evidence supports that, I believe. But that's because it's, it's a sign. It's showing that the Creator commanded that for the Israelites to show that they were be a holy people. And they are not to be uh, living according to the, the pleasures of the flesh. They are to be pure, holy. And that's why that, just like the angels, they are to be pure and holy. So angels are not supposed to be sexual beings. And so the Israelites um, cut off the foreskin as a symbol of that. And there's no, there's no, um, uh, there's no um, feminine, uh, there's no female circumcision. Um, so, uh, and I believe the reason for that is male circumcision can be safely done. Um, but uh, female circumcision is not safe to do, in my opinion. Uh, now, Jeremy, you, you said you know adult friends who said that they don't agree that sexual pleasure is diminished. I can't speak for everyone, but I have heard conflicting information on that point. Like, I have heard other people who have undergone uh, reconstruction of foreskin who claim that now that they have a foreskin, uh, it feels more pleasurable. But I think from at least a scientific perspective, I'm pretty sure the, f the foreskin does have like a, it does have, um, it does have like uh, certain nerve endings that the, um, that if you, if you cut it off, you remove some of those nerve endings. But whether or not it diminishes it to a significant degree or not, it may not. I've only read about it, so I can't say for sure. I could be wrong on that. Um, I, so I guess I'll end there for today. I guess uh, Michael left because he didn't like circumcision. But uh, and do you guys have any um, thing you wanted to say before we end this? Like any questions or thoughts? He had to go to work. Oh, he had to go to work. Yeah. Oh, another another excuse. Uh, Jackson, do you have anything final you want to say? Well, uh, we need we need to get some more people in here. Uh, well, we yeah. had six originally, so that was yeah. Fun. Well, I think one time we had eight people. Let's see, we could beg. No, no, but um, why don't you get in touch with those guys in the Netherlands? They're which really one? interested in this. That's Navio and Daoud. I just don't know when it's good for them time wise, but yeah. But uh, well, we, could, uh, we could always change. I think there's about an eight hour difference, so it's it's either going to be smack dab in the middle of the night, or it's going to be ten o'clock at night, probably in the middle of the night. Okay. Before you guys go, Jeremy, uh, you talked about um, uh, how you were going through a study of. I mean, you were kind of inspired to kind of do a little bit of a of a study on the chronology. Have, have <clears throat> Where are you in that? Have you gone any progress? Or are you kind of stuck? 
Um, no, I'm just uh, currently um, charting. I got kind of sidetracked with reading Jubilees again. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, I'm, I'm charting out um, two different things. One is the uh, timeline in Jubilees. I'm I'm charting it out in a spreadsheet just to uh, see it on a grid, basically. Um, I can actually give a little screenshot real quick. I'll show you what it looks like. Um, I don't know if you can see that. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just charting it out like that. You can see in here, you know, Shem was born, Noah's born, you know, so on and so forth. Different, different events when people die, when people born and like certain events that I thought maybe were, um, interesting. Yeah. And, that's then the other part is I'm comparing uh, the Masoretic with the Septuagint, the Samaritan, Jubilees, Genesis Apocrypha, Jasher, Josephus, Enoch, the Targum of Jonathan, Onkelos, the Syriac. Oh, uh, wow. <laughs> I'm going to try to put them all in there. I could say you could probably get rid of Genesis Apocrypha because um, it doesn't really give information too much. Like right. it doesn't really give any dates because it's fragmentary. So. Okay. Um, I mean, you could you could check to make sure, but I don't I don't think you'll find much in there to to add. So I would probably I think yeah, gonna, that column could be removed. I'm gonna go ahead and add um, whatever whatever books seem appropriate, you know, and remove whatever ones are inappropriate. Oh, you you had Josephus there, right? Uh, yeah, or I believe not. so. If he's yeah, Josephus has different different things too. Um, are you gonna go and extend yeah. it like past? Are you gonna end with Moses, or are you gonna go past, like, all the way up until uh, the Messiah? Um, I'll because... probably. I, I mean, I'm gonna leave this open, open ended, and because okay. I have a tendency to get sidetracked easily with other things, like reading Jubilees, for instance. <laughs> but uh, to have the document started and to um, be able to plug in dates as I come across them, knowing that I have this document out there. I can go and just, I can just throw it in. I don't have to like recreate this thing every time or. or yeah, else. that's good. And you know, so I'll keep it open ended, but I'll probably focus on getting through. Um, um, probably, I, I mean, my my idea was to to get through uh, Abraham, and just just to see there. But I would like to go as far as I can because I think that the more we see the discrepancy in these dates, um, especially if there's longer ones compared to the Masoretic, that's pushing us, you know, further and further into, you know, somebody, some might call the millennium, you know, so. I, w I would go at least until like through the book of Jubilees because um, mm -hmm. there's a lot of information on that. Then afterwards, your main sources are just Masoretic and Septuagint for the rest of the scriptures. I'm sorry I got to break in because we've got a meeting here at two. Oh yeah, sure. And they can't get on until we get off. All, All right. right, sounds good. Thank you guys. Thanks, Jackson. Thank you. Peace.